I'm now going to introduce Francis Morlapay. Okay, Francis, brief introduction here. There's a longer one, but Deborah's going to use the longer one tonight, right, Deborah? Okay, so in 1987, Francis received the Right Livelihood Award, considered an alternative Nobel, for revealing the political and economic causes of world hunger and how citizens can help to remedy them. Her first book, Diet for a Small Planet, I'm guessing some of you brought those to get signed today. We'll have to see if Francis is willing. I'm pretty sure Wolfram did. Only if they're staying, I can assure you, pretty much assure you they're stains. Uh, that book sold three million copies and is considered the blueprint for eating with a small carbon footprint since long before the term was coined. She's the author of 18 books. She's the co-founder of three organizations, including Food First, the Institute for Food and Development Policy, and more recently, the Small Planet Institute, a collaborative network for research and popular education seeking to bring democracy to life, which she leads with her daughter, Anna LePay, whose book we featured in our class this last year in Food and Society. Her most recent work, released by Nation Books in September 2011, is EcoMind. I've got to, I guess I'll ask you later to sign it, okay? Thanks. <laughs> Changing the way we think to create the world we want. In 2008, she received the James Beard Foundation Humanitarian of the Year Award for her lifelong impact on the way people all over the world think about food, nutrition, and agriculture. Francis, will you help us kick it off? Thanks. Thank you, Christopher. What a total joy. He picked me up at the airport last night with all that energy, and it, it really uh, helped. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, I just want to compliment you first on the beautiful logo for this summit. Uh, so, um, I am delighted to be here, very, very happy to be here, because in part, very personally, this is a very special moment in my life. This fall is the 40th anniversary of Diet for a Small Planet. And thank you. It's a time, as you can imagine, of a lot of retro, you know, introspection, looking back, retrospection. But I have to tell you, just, I was telling this to Jesse Cool because it just seems so emblematic of my life path. I gave birth to Anna some decades ago, my daughter, who I now work with. Soon after, I learned, we learned together that actually Anna in Sanskrit is food. <laughs> so, you know, and then she named her daughter Ida, and then we learned soon after that Ida is the Hindu goddess of food. And then this little Hindu goddess of food, I was babysitting this weekend, and she starts singing, twinkle, twinkle, little star. But when she gets to up above the sky so high, like a diner in the sky, <laughs> she thinks. So somehow this food thing is really imprinted in the La Pay women. Um, so uh, I am thrilled to be here on this uh, at any time, but especially meaningful right now. So I'm looking back, and okay. 40 years ago. This summit is, in a sense, for me, and there is so much going on now in the world around the power of food. So I'm looking back and realizing that, just take you back to Diet for Small Planets, first hitting the stands, and do you know that the National Cattlemen's Association actually set a team of cooks to prove that you could not eat this food? <laughs> And here we are, 40 years later, and we have Jesse Cool, we have Cool Cafe, Platt Street Cafe, we have so much uh, to prove them absolutely wrong, of course. Things have improved a lot since uh, the 1970s. I remember sitting with Alice Waters when we interviewed her for our book, Hope's Edge, and Alice was saying, you know, how wonderful it is, and how, you know, we've gone from stir fries to what we have today, and I didn't have the nerve to admit to Alice Waters that I still love stir-fried vegetables over brown rice, but I do. Um, so some sense of the distance. Uh, 40 years ago, of course, most schoolyards, in which I have many scars on my knees to prove, were hard asphalt, and now I'm sure you Californians know that just in your state alone, there are 3,000 school gardens. 40 years ago, there were not enough farmer's markets for USDA even to register, count them. And I think this is a true story. I'm still tracking down the details. And if any of you know this, tell me. But in the mid-70s, the, the, the way that I understand the 
explosion of farmer's markets is in the mid-70s that there was an, a huge harvest of peaches that peach farm, peach orchard people couldn't sell, and so they wanted to sell them directly. But the regulations were that they couldn't do that, that it was against the law. So they dumped them on Jerry Brown's capital in, in I believe this was 76, on the yard of their, the grounds of the capital. And a year later, he passed legislation enabling farmers markets. And today, there are over 7,000, just in the last year alone, a 17% increase in farmers markets. 40 years ago, yes, organic, for me anyway, just brought up bad memories before you know, I began this process, bad memories of college chemistry. And today, it is, as you know, the fastest growing segment of our food system. And just in the last decade, organic acreage worldwide has tripled. 40 years ago, small farmers who still um, grow 70% of our food, uh, they were rarely heard. But today, the organization Via Campesina represents over 200 million small farmers around the world working for what they are calling food sovereignty. And today, the right to food is now enshrined in more than two dozen uh, constitutions. So, there is definitely a huge, huge change. Oh, I wanted to mention, Christopher encouraged me, on our website, um, when we were doing all this thinking of what the road that we've traveled, we came up with the idea of a food timeline that you can actually you know, scroll through. And so if you wanted to go to our website at some point, smallplanet.org, and if you, go to, if you click on the food environment tab of our website, you'll see it right there the food timeline, and you can scroll through and please tell us what we don't have on that timeline that you think is a big milestone and tell us why you think it is. And we had some of the luminaries in the food movement give us their, their ideas about what the milestones should be that we would put on that, on that timeline. So for me, the global food movement <laughs> uh, that I feel that we are all part of and it's so important to think in that big, big way is that its power is that it taps absolutely universal, cross cultures, needs and sensibilities. So I think of you know, the Hindu farmers in India who are now rejecting GMOs and re-embracing seed saving. I think of the farmers, of Muslim farmers in Niger who are pushing back the desert and I'll show you an image of that accomplishment tonight. I think of uh, American Christian farmers who are interpreting creation care as their call to sustainable farming. So the food movement has tremendous power. It has the power to shift our sense of self. Because the dominant paradigm tells us that we are just victims operating, uh, self-interested little egos operating in a market that operates on its own, doesn't really need us. That is what was captured in Ronald Reagan's phrase, the magic of the market. But the food movement awakens the sense that no, we are not just passive consumers, we are active co-creators, shaping a market according to our values, both through the rules that we're creating and the choices that we're making every day, whether it be to support a community-supported agriculture, purchase a fair trade product, or in, in terms of setting the rules, weighing in on 2012 Farm Bill. The food movement power, therefore, I believe, is connection itself, that corporatism, the dominant mental map, distances us from one another, from the earth, and even from our own bodies, tricking us to eat things that are actually destroying our bodies. So while the food movement does the opposite, it celebrates our reconnection at all of those levels. And just one memory I have of that very um, very human connection. I was visiting uh, CSAs in Madison, Wisconsin a few years ago, and I was talking to Barb Perkins, one of the CSA farmers, and she said, Frankie, she said, 
you know, what pleases me so much about our lives now is not just that we're making it financially, but like it's what happened in town last week when I was shopping and this little kid, I saw him tugging on his mom's uh, purse and saying, mommy, mommy, look, there's our farmer. <laughs> And also reminded in that regard that my little step-grandson at three last um, Halloween, who has gone to our CSA with us every Saturday over the growing season, and he decided that he wanted to be a farmer for Halloween. <laughs> and he'd only seen a woman farmer to that point, so I thought that was really cool. So my sense, and this is a theme of EcoMind, my new book, is that, is that this movement encourages us to think like an ecosystem, and that is profound. It enables us to see our place for us, our place connected to all others at all times. And so we learn that in ecological systems, as my friend physicist Hans-Peter Dürer has put it, in ecological systems, there are no parts, there are only participants. And that is a very different way of seeing life. So with an eco-mind, we can let go of this productivist fra frame that keeps us producing, producing both more food and more hunger. And we can drop the premise of lack with the fear that that engenders is us, in us and embrace what I think of as a premise of possibility that is one that understands that once we align with nature, both human nature and nature itself, uh, then there's more than enough for all. So I'm saying that I'm so happy to be here celebrating, learning, moving forward with you because I believe that the food movement stirs and meets deep human need for connection, for power, and for fairness. And so let's not let anyone tell us that this is just a nice thing that we're doing. It is also powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.